Welcome to this talk about MISIM. Um, I've been attending a tech town for several years now and I've always found uh, it very interesting to hear about other people's applications of C++ and how they did all the software. So now it's my time to uh, tell a, talk a little bit about our tool that we developed with C++, the Missile Simulator. First, just a few sentences about myself. My name is Arnstein. Uh, I work at the Missile Division at Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace. I've been part of the simulation team uh, since 2013. Uh, my previous job leader, he, had, uh, he made this f funny logo this, that we admire a lot, and uh, so I just wanted to include it for illustration. There's not that much fire going on when we do our simulations. Um, I'd talk, like to talk a rather long time just introducing the theme uh, before I get on to our software in the loop simulator MISIM. Um, I have to talk a little bit about missiles first, how we test and verify them, where of course simulators are introduced. And uh, I want to talk especially about uh, software in the loop simulator MISIM and discrete event simulation in particular. And the difficulties in getting the missile application running as a model into our simulator, which is uh, the most important part, the important part as far as I, I'm concerned. So uh, I would like to conclude about what we use it for. So uh, first, a little bit about our missiles. We have uh, several generations of missiles. Uh, we have the NSM that was developed, uh, started development a long time ago already, 1995. Is a ship-launched or truck-launched missile. It's already in service. It has a range of about 100 nautical miles. 400 kilos, about four meters long. Um, the JSM, which we some of us talked about earlier on, is a newer <coughs> missile. We started development in around 2010. It's air-launched. Uh, it's designed to fit into the internal carriage of the Lockheed Martin F-35. Um, is currently under integration into the Lockheed Martin F-35 and has a longer range than the NSM. Similar weight and length of risk values. Um, just to give you an idea what a missile is, uh, it's a highly complex piece of engineering. Uh, it's hardware, it's uh, software, the sensors, there's mechanics. Um, we have fin actuators, we have a jet engine, fuel, uh, laser altimeters, navigation sensors, uh, and I, I like to illustrate the, the lugs, which I, when they explained how they worked to me, I was uh, pretty impressed because there's simply uh, the mechanical d design is such that it, they rotate into the fuselage once they're launched by themselves, by gravity. Uh, pretty neat. Um, and of course we have computers, power converters. Um, a little bit more details about the computer resources that we have, uh, just to um, keep in mind that the uh, a generation in missile is like I don't know decades of generations of computer platforms. We you know, in the NSM we st we use the PowerPC and MPC 860 platform. Uh, today we have uh, the Core ID uh, P4080, which is like I don't know how many gigahertz. There's a difference, but it's a lot. Uh, we have a lot more. Uh, RAM to deal with. We have uh, different operating systems, but as you can see, we already started using C++ in the NSM development. So that's uh, um, uh, a common factor between we uh, C++ has been chosen as our development language, and we've used it since 1995. Uh, a little bit more about all the technologies that are integrated into MSL. We have inertial navigation, imaging, flight control, route planning. We have a multi-core computing platform that requires thermal control. Um, all this is to say that it's extremely software intensive, our application, and more than 60% of the system requirements affect software. So we have a lot of software in our MSL. Um, and so how do we uh, test and verify all this? This is where we get to see a software in loop for the first time. Um, a missile is complex. It takes a long time to develop. Uh, as you can see on the previous slides, we, the NSM development program was like 15 years. Uh, in order to uh, uh, 
reduce, in order to verify and test our system, we have several levels of test arenas, we like to call them. Uh, we start in the small scale unit tests for software. We have, we can integrate them, them together into software in the loop simulators. And as the software and the hardware gets more mature, uh, we can start making hardware in the loop simulators too. And of course, the, the final test that we aim for is the flight test, uh, the missile flight test, the actual. But they are extremely costly, both in times of money and and, and, and time, uh, you have there are years of planning in order to perform a flight test. There's not that many places in the world that can do them. Uh, so we aim to do as much verification as we can in our simulators, in our hardware and loop simulators, and in our software and loop simulators. And um, we can do that. Um, first, a little bit about hardware and loop simulators. Um, that is where we actually take the actual hardware in the missile, uh, we lay it out, and we apply simulated uh, sensors and uh, simulate, uh, simulate the actuators and simulate the environment. Uh, the benefit of this is that we have the actual hardware present in our test simulator. We have the actual operating system that's running. Um, we have the complete software stack running on the target. Uh, and this is uh, very useful for, this is the f only real place where you have, you can discover real timing issues uh, in your software. And, uh, uh, but it requires a lab, it's a pretty complex piece of equipment too, having a hardware and loop simulator. Uh, of course the <coughs> benefits of doing real-time simulations is that you get the timing issues, uh, but you don't do deterministic simulations what we, that we, um, we want for statistical analysis. So we have the software in the loop simulators where um, we put the actual missile operational software into the simulator together with the models that simulate the environment and the actuators and the sensors. Um, this is a pretty realistic setup too because we have so much software in our missile. So it's, um, you can do a, a great lot of testing and verification at already at this level. You don't get the complete uh, test level before you do the hardware and the loop and the flight test, but you can do pretty much there. And uh, that's what we want to uh, explore a little bit. So what is MISIM, what is composed of? Oh, first a little history, yeah. Uh, just to say that we have been doing this already since, since NSM development. We actually had a simulator before, but the, let's say that the framework, the simulation framework and the models that we use today uh, were developed during the NSM development phase. It's developed mainly in C++, just like the application. But we do use a lot of Python for um, startup and control and tools related to uh, the simulation. Um, the capabilities. Um, we counted the line of, uh, uh, line of, sort of code as well in the application. I see that we got to a different number than you did in your, pre <laughs> your previous presentation. Uh, but it's just to say that um, the ability to put the entire uh, a big part of the missile application into the simulator is, uh, is actually quite uh, is a nice thing to do. And it's a lot of code that we put into it. And we also uh, keep in mind that the missile application, as it runs currently in our simulator, is about approximately 300 concurrent threads, so, uh, which all has to be controlled, uh, which we do. Uh, we have been able to uh, create a a deterministic simulator. So um, what that basically says is that for um, we control the flow of execution in our simulator so that when we put uh, have the same input to our simulation we always get the same output every time. This is the sort of the basis to do uh, statistic uh, analysis uh, further on um, which is useful for anything that has to do with uh, our navigation algorithms or flight control algorithms. You have to do statistical analysis to sort of validate them. 
Uh, another benefit that we find is that um, since it we um, we control the flow of execution in our simulator, we can run basically a whole missile application in our debugger. And when there's an error, sort of a, like a, a null point pointer or something, it will always appear because we control the flow of execution. So we can see it and we get it every time. And it's pretty, uh, it's very helpful to have that kind of debug possibilities on your desktop. Uh, of course, in, when you get to the hardware and loop simulations, you also have uh, debug possibilities, but there's, it's a lot harder. Um, just another illustration that we uh, of our, uh, what MISIM is, uh, mainly just to put the missile operational software in the middle because it's the most important part. And we have the simulated environment. Uh, we simulate the hardware, that's the bottom arrow there, uh, and that is MISIM. And I have another slide saying more or less the same, but I put some different names to stuff and I introduce our simulation framework which is sort of the glue between the, the models on our left-hand side, which are the like sort of what I associate with models, uh, what, I, what I thought was models before I heard about model-based development or engineering. Uh, it's basically sensor models, uh, six degrees of freedom, aerodynamics, uh, the things you, you normally do in Simulink or in MATLAB. We have a simulation framework in between, uh, and what I'm trying to get to is uh, <coughs> how we are, have these models on the left-hand side and how we get to uh, run the missile operational software in a simulator. Well, we treat it as a model too. That's uh, a key point. Um, so in order to do that, I've added a little more detail to our uh, simulation framework. It's actually composed of two simulators. We have a hybrid simulator on your left-hand side can, uh, handling the models, and we have created a, something called a discrete event simulator on your right-hand side, which is, uh, uh, controls the uh, execution of the missile application. In order to do so, we uh, had, we sort of had, we had, we have the missile application, it already exists, and we need, needed to find a way to execute it in our simulator. So we had to see what, um, uh, what sort of requirements does the missile application have to fulfill in order to run in a simulation, and what actually is a discrete event simulator. So I'm going to talk a little bit first about the discrete event simulator, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the missile application afterwards. Um, first of all, just some notions. Uh, about stating that a computer simulation models some behavior over time, this is important, and that the system is represented by a set of state variables that change over time. And what we call continuous simulation is when we have actual differential equations that describe these state variables. And we call it discrete event simulation when uh, they are not uh, differential equations but just uh, a sequence of events in time. And then finally, we coined the term hybrid simulation, combining the two, because that's one of the, what one of our simulators do. Um, so, the discrete event simulator. Um, basic, it's not that complicated, actually. Uh, it basically provides an interface for some simulation application. I'm um, being uh, sort of a little bit more generic here, but the simulation application is, in our terms, the missile application. It uh, provides an interface for scheduling events in time. The discrete event simulator adds that event to some a queue, and it's sorted by time, and then it processes them. That's sort of the main, the main loop. Uh, of course, it has con the control of the simulation clock variable as well. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, so when you relate that to the first picture, uh, what we see is they have a missile application, and we need to uh, make events. So then the key question is, is how do you make actually the, all, all the things that the missile application do into events? Well, you see that the missile application mainly does input-output operations. It does inter-task communication, which is message-based, luckily, and we have time functions, sleep and timers and so on. 
So we need to make all these things into events so that our discrete event simulator can control them. As you can see, uh, the layered architecture that we have in MSL applications is going to be play a key part. Um, we need to modify some of the key components of our missile application in order to do so. Uh, but we're in luck. The missile application is, has a, a brilliant uh, design so that we can do such uh, just such a thing. Uh, the, well, I'll sort of sort of the three points that are important for us is the, the missile application has a great separation of the logical design and the deployment. Uh, it has a layered software architecture. Um, for support platform independent software, and it uses message-based inter-thread communication. Um, just a few short slides about what they are, just to be sure we talk about the same thing. Uh, the separation of the logical design and deployment, which was what Turmud and Trigve talked a lot more in detail about the earlier this afternoon. Uh, for me, the important part is that um, the components they are developed in C++, they are components, and we have something else that controls how these actually talk to each other. It's a, another configuration language entirely. Uh, the main part is that we can do this. We can have this deployment on target, and you can easily put it in another uh, deployment uh, and assure that the components A and B, they are exactly the same in both cases. <coughs> Uh, the second part is the layered uh, software architecture. I guess we all do this pretty much now. Uh, we've been doing it about since since about year 2000. Uh, it was important for uh, us at KDA, at, uh, the missile division, to create platform independent applications. We have a really nice layered uh, software stack. Of course, um, being, I don't know, uh, a defense an embedded company, we, we tend to like to develop everything ourselves. So uh, every, uh, almost every part of the, uh, the layered uh, software stack here is developed in-house, uh, except for the operating system. So of course this makes it a lot easier to mo add the key modifications in order to uh, put the application into the simulator. Uh, so the third part was that we use uh, message-based inter-thread communication. Um, the same principle, you have a component A and a component B, and the, the actual message passing is completely separated from the functionality in the co components. Uh, so that when we, um, makes it easy to, de to deploy and to, uh, uh, to make changes to the middleware, knowing that we don't uh, affect the functionality in the components. Uh, of course, if our applications had been doing sort of like shared memory type communication, this would be a lot harder to run our, to create our simulator. So that's uh, the same slide once more. We saw that we had to modify a, some computer, a few parts here, and we have added an event queue to our discrete event simulator. Um, but there was one more problem, is that we have, there are so many concurrent tasks in the missile application, and we need to control how they are executed. And how do we do that? And uh, we found a technique called cooperative multitasking. Uh, if you'll read at Wikipedia, it will give you a pretty good explanation of what it is. It's, pr it's pretty much um, a technique for allowing tasks um, uh, where tasks are not preempted anymore. Uh, they have to run until they are completed, and then themselves they pass the control to the scheduler. Uh, this was actually how multitasking was done way back in Windows, 16 bits Windows, and that was well also why everything crashed from time to time, because you had tasks that blocked. Because, the, of course, the problem here is that if, if something blocks, everything blocks. So it's a trade-off. Um, so just a few more point bullets about the cooperative multitasking. It, um, the implementation 
is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can do it on top of preemptively scheduled threads, which is what you have in uh, normal operating systems, uh, just by adding a scheduler and some synchronization. Um, what you achieve is that you only run thread once it runs at a time, so you get no parallelism. Uh, this is the main point we want to achieve because the missile application has 300 threads that normally run on target in some scheme. Uh, we do not aim to sort of replicate the same architecture on target. What we aim to do is just run the missile application deterministically, so we have to have uh, the f control the flow execution. And that is what we do when we only let one thread run at a time. Um, so, how of course, there are some rules. Threads may not block except to yield control to the scheduler thread. And there's another important point is that the threads, they have to tell the scheduler what they're waiting for before blocking. So, it could be one of two things. Either you wait for uh, I don't have anything more to do until a specific time, or uh, I have to wait for something to happen. Sort of like a, a typical example for that would be uh, you have a message, uh, have a, a thread that's waiting for a message coming in. It will be waiting on a receive on some input queue, and then the condition to actually uh, let that thread run again would be there's something in the queue. And this is what the scheduler evaluates at every time. So we introduced a cooperative scheduler. Uh, he is in charge of determining which thread that should be run next. It has a list of uh, the predicate callable objects. It's actually just a list of conditions, um, objects with conditions, and uh, the list of objects that should be called at a specific time. So once we have all this, we have an application that may execute in virtual time. It may execute as a discrete event simulation. So this was one of the sort of, uh, uh, and we did that without having to do um, too much. Uh, for us it was sort of a, when we realized this as was a, a way of introducing the missile application into a discrete event simulator, we saw that the necessary modifications to do here and here were not that big. Um, the middleware, of course, the most important part there was that we had to control the, the message flow. So when task A and task B talks, they, uh, all the messages are converted into events. And at the OS abstraction layer, it's more, more importantly uh, hardware stuff and timers. If anyone tries to do a, a, a sleep, uh, we have to uh, interact and make that into an event. So, um, that was um, the right-hand side. Um, the right-hand side, in my opinion, was the most important part because actually if we take our simulator in total, uh, the right-hand side is like uh, two-thirds of it in terms of lines of code and, uh, uh, and size. But of course it doesn't work on its own. Um, it has a... It has to work with the hybrid simulator 2, which is uh, also important. This is where we put all our uh, years of experience in modeling actually missile hardware in an environment. Uh, so there's an exchange of data, and more importantly, the, these two simulators are synchronized in time. Uh, so that is more or less... Uh, so if we draw a timeline, you can see that... Um, these two hybrid, these two simulators sort of like step up one after the other in time. Um, an example of um, data flow. Um, I. Uh, this is a really the most basic loop we sort of have in our simulator. Uh, the missile operational software, or the more, more Concretely, the, the flight control software, uh, it sort of works by re reading uh, navigation or, or sensor data from the inertial measurement unit, uh, which the navigation system processes, which gives us input to the flight control system, which uh, gives commands based on, on these positions. What our simulator does is that when we get to 
Uh, so this actually happens in the first simulator, on the one on the right hand side. And then it passes data over to the other simulator. And the other simulator will run for a, a time step and it will generate uh, all sorts of data that basically ends up in another angular velocity and a specific force. Um, on your left hand side, I have the colors of the boxes is just to have an idea that um, we have uh, hardware models that are often discrete uh, event models and you have normal uh, differential equation models which are the green, green ones. The green ones are uh, like the uh, six degrees of freedom and the wind and the atmosphere model. They are um, pretty standard. You find them in the literature, uh, which is special for every application. If you want to uh, make your own simulator, is you have to have good models for your hardware, which is um, uh, a hard part. You need a lot of experience to make them. Um, so of course, the, uh, the good part in I'm just going to move back here. The, the important part here is that when we have a simulator that includes the actual missile operational software, you have a powerful tool because it's not, it does simulations on something that's actually uh, deployed onto a target computer. Uh, but the simulator doesn't get any better than your models on the left hand side. So we have, they have to be good enough in order to perform, uh, have a faith in your simulation results. So the, all the models on the left hand side, they um, if you go all the way back to that was a long way. Here, oh, click there. You see that uh, these arrows indicate that we have some sort of experience cycle here. So that the, everything that we learn, either being it in hardware in the loop setups or in missile flight test. We have to put that back into both our system and into our models, both. Hmm. So now I have to get all the way back to... Yeah, here. Uh, so... I'm being a lot quicker than I was when I rehearsed. Um, just to have a, give a short description about what MISIM looks like. It's basically a command line tool. It's an it's a application you run from the command line. Uh, it can have a graphical front end, but it mostly runs in batches on simulation servers. And uh, the way we configure our simulator is by files, configuration files, and the output is even more files. So you have files and files and files. Uh, there's all the files going on, uh, but it's it's a nice way to do it anyway, since it's you have to, you want to do, you want to put your simulation into some sort of, sort of batch server so that you can just process them when they um, uh, automatically without you having to do too much. Um, short, just a short view of our graphical interface to show, give you an idea of what it is. Um, what you see here on the left hand side is just the, the basic standard out from our application. Uh, you, don't, you don't get a lot of details on the simulation results here because all the details in the simulation results are in some log files somewhere. But what you do get is um, uh, some sort of uh, overall uh, picture of what happened. Uh, did the simulation terminate because the simulation time ended or did it terminate because you hit the ground or the sea or did you actually hit the target? Uh, did you detonate? Uh, so you get some sort of information here. And we can do a little plotting uh, on the way, uh, just to have an idea if your missile is actually trying to fo follow the trajectory that you, uh, you estimated or not. Um, yeah. Um, so what do we use MISIM for? So the most important uh, thing we use MISIM for is test and verification. Uh, we use it uh, to test and verify system uh, requirements uh, for our missiles. Uh, we use it also, since it's basically a software tool running on a desktop, we use it to integrate software. Uh, 
uh, we can find errors earlier than having, um, we want to find errors as early as possible without going all the way down to our labs in order to find them, if it's just software problems. Um, of course, we use it to do analysis. Uh, we, we do uh, analysis before flight tests, we do analysis after flight tests. And uh, finally, um, we also uh, do it to prototype new stuff. Uh, if you have um, a working simulator for a, a missile, uh, which mm, contains basic uh, components like navigation and flight control. Uh, you can sort of like, uh, okay, I want to, I want to see what this new autopilot can do in launch, and then you just uh, you take out the component, and this also is really easy thanks to the uh, model-based system, the software engineering we do. So you can just take the uh, one uh, autopilot application out and put it another in, and you can do sim lots of simulations, and you can uh, compare results with the old uh, autopilot and new one, and s uh, do um, decisions based on that. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about statistical analysis. Uh, just. Um, an example that I got from a, a colleague of mine, uh, what he does with the MISIM. Uh, this is an example of where he uh, has actually done just that. He, has a, he wanted to test a new autopilot for the launch phase. And uh, uh, when you have MISIM, you can basically say, OK, uh, I have this new autopilot. It's configured like this. And I want to see how does it work uh, with all these sets of conditions, like uh, wind, wave, uh, the launch position, the uh, orientation, uh, thrust misalignment on your booster, and you can run uh, uh, just per parameter variation, or you can just do Monte Carlo simulations on all this, and you get these kind of curves, and you can see, okay, so uh, basically I'm pretty sure that my uh, autopilot will never exceed this height during launch or go below this. And so you have something you can decide on later on. So I'm getting to the end. I just wanted to say that um, software and loop simulators, they are great. Uh, they're especially great if you are able to put the actual control system into your simulator. That provides a huge added value to it. Um, making it deterministic is very valuable. Uh, it allows you to do statistical analysis. You can parameter, parameter variation, covariation, uh, Monte Carlo simulations. And uh, most import importantly in all this, it reduces the time and the cost of verification. So, uh, hmm, pretty quick there, yeah. And just to, uh, yeah, I have one final bullet just to ex exemplify that. The JSM flight program test, it was seven flight tests. I don't know how many, how many of the Americans used, but we used seven. And that includes the failed ones. So, uh, and in the end, we did a flight that was 200 kilometers plus. It worked into several heights, a uh, pretty complex, uh, complex scenario. And we uh, hit the right target at the right place, as you, uh, you had a video about that. Yeah. Uh, um, and it blew up, as it should. And uh, uh, one final note, too, is that during the two um, failure flight tests, it wasn't software that failed, it was hardware. <laughs> <laughs> Important. Questions? questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. I have actually two questions. I can take them one at a time. Please um, do. You talked about uh, virtual, virtual time. Yep. Um, could you say a bit more about that uh, term compared to real time and virtual time? Or what's, uh, uh, difference. Um, and, and how is it solved? Because the so I guess the, the mission software is highly dependent on time. real time. Oh, yeah, yeah it absolutely is. Um, it goes back to, um, I think I'm going to have to, it took me a long time to go all the way back. Let's see if I can find it. Um, the main, the main question is that uh, once, you, uh, once you're able to make your uh, application run in a discrete event simulator, uh, you're more or less uh, 
And because see, I can find you. Da -da -da. Yeah, we get here. I can show this one. Hop. Once you get here and you have actually uh, added the necessary modification to to software in order to make it run here. Um, when you do that, uh, what you say is that everything important for the missile application is translated into an event. <coughs> so even time stuff is translated into events. So that's the abstraction, actually. Uh, when you get, get here, uh, a call to uh, get microsec, it will uh, resolve into uh, an event that actually is, mm, give me your time variable. Because as you saw early on, this discrete event simulator has a, is a, has a time variable. And that is the time now. And this time is now unrelated to whatever time the clock on the computer is. And this has to do with the sort of the serialization that we do with the missile application in order to run it deterministically. Uh, the advantage is that if you get uh, quick computers, you can maybe do your simulations like two times faster than real time. But what we see is that basically when the missile application is getting very big, it slows down. So <laughs> our simulations are slower than real time, actually, and sometimes. Was that it? Yeah, that's great. And a second question? Uh, Monte Carlo simulations, what's that? Monte Carlo simulations, is, uh, they are, uh, it has to do with statistical analysis. Uh, so what you do is you um, use, um, a random, you have a distribution of values that's uh, either flat or um, Gaussian, and you uh, and you pick values from it. And uh, what you use it for is that you actually have, say, you have a, a parameter that it could be a sort of a, a gain value in a in a control algorithm, and you want it. Okay, let's see what happens if you it varies from this extremity to the other. But you don't want to see, say, okay, use that value, that value, and that value. But you see. You say use, a, uh, use this distribution, distribution of values and uh, some seed, and this will create actually a set of values that you use. Uh, this set of value is supposed to, well, it depends on your distribution actually, the set of values. If you want uh, a Gaussian, it will get more points around the middle, and if it's flat, we'll get it all over the place. Uh, it's basically just used for statistic analysis so that you can see. Um, what happens to my algorithm when the parameter varies from here to here. And the values that I choose are random, sort of. Uh, I'm not that much of a user of it, but I guess you get the sort of curves that I showed in the end of the slide, uh, in the end. Hmm. Yes? Yeah, mine is very related to the first one, uh, about time. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you just had, uh, yeah, you had your own call to get milliseconds or yep. whatever. Uh, does that mean that you don't use like a steady clock timer and, uh, in the in the operating? Uh, oh no, no. The applica the application, uh, uh, the missile application. He, the time used here is uh, completely discorrelated from the the system operated time. It yeah. the, the 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 time he says is the time that we set here, and um, I didn't elaborate too much on that. But the way that uh, the discrete event simulator and the hybrid simulator that work together, they, they have to sort of step up in time together. So that uh, once he's sort of done, he doesn't have any more events at that time because these events are sorted in time. Uh, then the other uh, simulator will run. He will create an event and uh, it will make uh, the event will be something like, uh, okay, I have a new simulation, I have a new sensor data input for you. And then he, but it's, uh, uh, its timestamp is sort of in the future, and then he will say, okay, but then I'm going to step my time variable up to that next event, which is like yeah, some... Do you still use, uh, for example, uh, steady clock timer? No. Uh, uh, okay. Or you, 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 you ban that and use uh, your own? So we are very strict on our functional uh, software. Yeah. We, all, we use the layers. We only use the faces to the layers. We don't bypass them. So uh, we uh, can intercept everything. So you, so you, cannot, you, you, you cannot use those functions? Oh, no, you, oh, no you're, 
your functional application layer has to uh, use the middleware and the our abstraction layer. Yeah, so you, so you, you, so you, you, you cannot use uh, steady time oh, No, 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 no. And you cannot wait for a condition variable for a certain time. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Uh, you can't do that. So, it, it, so if I have an application that uses those things and I want to do a discrete time event uh, simulator, I will have to clean my code from that and. You'd have, yes, you'd have to do that. You have a big, yep. The question is. So I guess it's somewhat related, but I was thinking more about performance. Can you, based on this model, look at the performance of the application in real time later on? So, kind of say, do I have hardware that is powerful enough to run all these tasks? You mentioned, for example, I introduced a new autopilot algorithm. Mm -hmm. It's really compute intensive. Mm -hmm. It may actually overrun in yeah. real time. It's how do you do that? It's an interesting question because. Um, we see the problem uh, often, uh, and we tend to, uh, if I go way back again, since we have these, uh, we uh, sort of hope that, for the time being, that we will see these kind of problems here. Uh, of course, uh, if it's a very common sort of time-intensive thing, you can introduce mechanisms into your middleware to say, for example, that oh, this is uh, something that's going to take X amount of milliseconds, and then the event will not be just a message passing thing, but a message passing thing in the future. Um, but it's complicated to do because the software is complicated, so it's sort of it's a very it's a changed uh, a chained uh, effect. Uh, so for the time being, we do that kind of analysis here. So we have to. Uh, so we, we do depend on all these test arenas in order to verify our missile. Hmm. So it, it's, we kind of we do scenarios in the in the MISIM and software, and then we do the same scenarios also in the hardware in the loop, and then we can uh, kind of see uh, how it works both functional. Is it the same or is it not the same? And what are the real real time performance? Hmm. Hmm. But it's an interesting question. Yes, please. Uh, slide, you, you claim that when you use, do, when you do hardware in the loop simulation, you, you simulate the sensors. Yes. Does that mean uh, that you run the hardware in the loop completely with the sensors disconnected, or do you stimulate the sensors? No, we, no we, the sensors are disconnected. We do two things in the hardware in the loop uh, setups. We have, uh, when you get down to the bottom level, there's some sort of electrical interface to the sensor. So that's where we cut it, and we put uh, a stimuli in. So uh, basically, stimulating the, the hardware. Yep. Yes. So yes, we are. Stimulating it in software, in the, in the hardware part. Uh, yes, we are. So there's a two things, two parts to that. You have to have a hardware um, yeah, yeah, layer you're, in between. You're, you're simulating the sensor. Yes. As if it was the real sensor. Yep, we are. You're not uh, sending it to software stream. Oh no, no, not at all. No, it's the, the if it, the if the sensor has so, so physical interface. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. So it's not the software. It's it's an electrical. Yes. So in the same time, when we come to the actuators, uh, what we do in uh, in the hardware loop is that we actually the actuators move, and we have these um, remember the name, uh, remember the name, but we we read act the act we read we encode the fin uh, deflection values. So that that's our input into our simulation, and we calculate new sensor data. Um, that's why getting here is. Uh, a lot more, you, you require a lot more maturity to your hardware as well as your software than that, that part. Hmm. Yep. Uh, do you simulate uh, torque on the fins? Uh, uh, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, our models are, uh, our models are, uh, we can have different uh, sets of models. We have different complexities, we call them. So it depends on what you. I mean, specifically in the hardware in the loop test. Oh, but in the hardware in the loop test, you have the actual uh, actuator system there. Yeah, but there will be not be. No. There's no air, aerodynamic no. pressure. No, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, um, mm, good. That simulates torque on the fin or Good question. I'm not. Uh, no, we, we don't do that. I don't think uh, we have. Uh, <laughs> we talked about if, but it's actually it's not a big factor. So we haven't I think. It, but you could have. Uh, or mm. something. 
I think I think the 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 what they uh, thought was that since the actuator system is so well, let's say over designed, mm -hmm. uh, the actual torque moments of the air are negligible to what uh, to the position. Okay. I think uh, it's uh, of course uh, when you get the simulators, it's never perfect. It has to be correct up to a certain level. Uh, so that's what we aim for. Um, and of course, that is also why we have these um, the experiences that we do uh, doing tests, both in the hardware and the loop and in, in the missile test. We have to bring those back into both our system and into our models as well. Mm. Yes, please. And when the missile detonates, do you clean up all the resources or do you just call them? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really uh, it's a really good question actually because uh, from the missile application perspective it's like oh I don't care <laughs> I'm blowing up anyway but if you want to put it into a simulator and you want to do several simulators in a row it's actually pretty important that we clean up properly and sort of redeploy the software once more so uh, we have our own regime for that to uh, actually delete all the user objects that uh, of which the missile application is composed and regenerate them. Mm. You can say a lot more safer. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that they go out of scope. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Um. Yes, please. The test is so expensive and so rare that it's always this with explosives, right? Oh, not at all. No, it was just the final one that was with explosives. So, uh, in no, we you start you, the missile flight test. You have to do it gradually. So you start like, uh, oh, we don't have an engine. <laughs> <laughs> we just perform. Uh, uh, I don't know, with lead. Yeah, uh, and then you put the engine on, and you uh, do t several tests with that, and it's the final one when you you have to blow things up. But it's important to do that too because uh, there's a set of uh, uh, of hardware, there's uh, some software logic um, uh, in order to make it detonate, so uh, the final test has to be with uh, explosives. Mm. Uh, yep. In JSM, uh, yes. I guess there's a, a huge integration with the software in the aircraft. Um, I'm not quite, uh, it's huge. We have an interface document that's like a thousand pages. Inside, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Is there any way to put that into the software in the loop uh, test? Um, not something, um, not something that Lockheed Martin made, uh, but we do have our own uh, sort of test versions of the application. Um, what we do is, it, well, of course, there's always a question of trade-off of the complexity of your simulation and uh, what you get in your turn. So, the actual um, when the JSM missile, for example, talks to the, uh, the uh, airplane, it, there's a lot of software, you have protocols, there's an electrical interface, and that, that makes a pretty big uh, software stack in the bottom. In our simulator, we say that uh, the bottom part is not that interesting for us, so we sort of cut it off in the middle there, and we create, have created our own um, uh, test airplanes that talk uh, at a certain interface level, uh, but we bypass uh, a lot of stuff in the bottom. But again, we do get that here. Uh, that's the important part. So uh, there are trade-offs here and here. You don't do the same thing in the, these two test arenas, but uh, you sort of try to balance the complexity of both of them. Of course, the hardware loop setup is the most complex one. Mm. I think uh, the, the point there is that, that the software in the loop is uh, to test your functionality. And uh, then with the hardware loop, you get all the nitty gritties with the functionality and see if it still works as it's, mm. as it's supposed to. Mm. Mm. Great. Great. Thank you. <laughs>